Well, good morning. It is certainly good to be back with you again. Um, certainly thankful for the, the weekend off to go to a retreat that was encouraging and uplifting. Certainly thank you for that as well, for everyone who filled in in the meantime. And as you know what, God's ministry keeps going because he's the one who powers it. It's not us. We just have roles that we play. Um, but I'm glad to be back into the role that God has called, placed me and I'm glad that he has you in your roles as well. And we get to enjoy some very beautiful weather. I had great weather, weather last weekend. We have some very beautiful weather. Um, we've had a couple days here, and then we're going to have some more this week as well. Um, not every day is going to be perfect, but still going to be some really nice fall weather coming up. So let us enjoy that. And speaking of beauty, Ulta Beauty. Uh, maybe you've seen that store or seen it somewhere. There's one in Lebanon near the old, old Sears, you know, where Kohl's is and so forth. Well, right in that corner, there's an Ulta Beauty store. And Ulta Beauty is the number one beauty retailer in the United States. And since 2015, they've grown by adding 22,000 new jobs. So they've grown quite a bit. Pretty impressive. Um, they actually are an award-winning company for diversity and inclusion. What exactly does that mean? Well, basically, the greatest example you can give is that recently they just helped sponsor a thing called Girl Talk, featuring two men pretending to be, well, thinking that they were women. And they were talking about the, the, uh, what, what made them happy, fulfilled, and accepted in life as women. But there are two men pretending to be women. In their minds, they think that they're women. They believe this about themselves, but they're really not. They're still men but they think that they're women. And the conversation, the, at least the, the portions that I saw, which I did not watch all of it, I only saw just about maybe five minutes of it, and the portions that I saw, I was very self-focused about what they had to do to make themselves and what others need to do to make themselves affirmed and happy and accepted and fulfilled and so forth. And it's just, oh, it's just so wonderful to be a girl. They weren't a girl, they just pretending to be a girl, but they still did. It's, it's a delusion, they're very confused. You have to, you know, and, and it's very sad that they, they have fallen for this because they're, they're not happy in life. And so they're, they're thinking that this is what's going to make them fulfill them and complete them. But you know, I shouldn't be surprised, and you shouldn't be surprised that these things are going on. Because when you go contrary to God's design and intent, you get selfishness. Because you're, you're thinking about, you get confusion, you get suffering, because you're thinking about yourself. See, please understand, God designed men and boys as men. And God designed women and girls as female. He got male and female, he created them. Men and women, boys and girls. Binary system. That's what he designed. Where one is to love God with their whole being and to love their neighbor as themselves. Those are the two greatest commands that summarize all the law and prophets. So that, that is exactly what we are to be doing. We were created and designed for this. To love God, that means to obey Him and follow Him. And to live the way that He has designed for us to do, which is, which is actually great and good because that's where the blessings are found. And we have to love our neighbor as ourselves. So in other words, you get God, others, and self. God, others, self. Right? Yeah. But what if you reject that? When you reject the created word that God has made, you get what? Well, I reject God, so I get me. Well, I reject others? Why well, am I going to put others? i got to take care of myself first, so me again... And then, and then, oh, and then, well, there's still myself. So it's me, myself, and I. That's what I get. It's about me. It's a path of selfishness. i got to make sure that I have what I need, and when I get that fulfilled, then I'll think about others. Yeah. When you reject the created order, that's what you get. And so you get a lot of confusion, because I'm just thinking about what I need. And so I begin searching my, for my own path in life rather than God's. And that leads to all kinds of confusion and pain, such that you get men who think that they're who believe that they're women, women who think that they are men, some who think that they are neither, some who think that they are both. They kind of you know go back and forth. It's very confusing. It's very painful. It's very hurt. It's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of a heartache and a lot of damage and a lot of dangerous stuff that is going on as a result of this because we're searching for a path that isn't there. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of hurt, a lot of suffering. But you know what? It's not new. It's not new at all. <clears throat> As sinners, we could fall into the devil's, the devil's trap of getting it backwards. And that's exactly what's happening. Our culture, many, many, including many Christians, we can get it backwards. We can think, I've got to satisfy myself first, then I can obey God. I've got to provide for myself first, then I can obey and do what God wants. That's when I find, you know, I've got to get this acceptance, I've got to get this, this, this fulfillment. 
and I've got to get this happiness first, then I can go and do what God is asking me to do. As Christians, we fall into this trap too. It's backwards. Totally backwards. As we'll see. Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai, Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns. Standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue it from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn uh, <clears throat> between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged it in great rage. I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became very rich. But at the height of his power, the large horn was broken off. And in his place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. That would be the promised land. Okay. Palestine. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens. And it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord. And his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did. And truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking. I mean an angel. And another holy one said to him, again an angel, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings and the sanctuary will be re-consecrated. I'm going to stop there. Because the rest of it goes into the interpretation, which is pretty clear based upon that. We'll just cover pieces of it. But I believe there's something underlying that is very important. First off, the angel Gabriel gives the interpretation. You meet Gabriel in the New Testament. Same angel. Yep. It's one of the archangels, if you will. Very close to the messenger of God, very clearly. And um, the vision that we see here is not much different from the chapters 2 and 7. Chapter 2, you had the statue of the four different types of metals, if you will, representing four different kingdoms, and then you have the kingdom of heaven that comes. And Daniel chapter 7, you have the four different beasts that arise, and then you have, of course, at the end there is a, a, the, the Son of Man who returns, and you have the kingdom of heaven is established. So here, you have something that's a smaller portion, it's focusing on the two following Babylon. And, Dan, and, and it's not like it's, this is my interpretation. Gabriel gives it to us. And he said the first one is Medo-Persia, and the second one is the Greek king. So, I mean, he very clearly tells us who they are. Okay? Now, he doesn't tell us exactly who the prominent horn that becomes strong through south and east and beautiful land and causes the desolation that causes desecration. So he doesn't talk about it, doesn't identify him specifically. But since we know the first one is the Greek king, we can very clearly figure out who this guy is. And we did but the thing I want you to understand here is that God confirms what he is about to do or what, or what is going to happen. God always confirms what he does. He's giving this to Daniel three times now. This vision basically has been given little different details each time, but it's confirmation of what is going to be coming. So he's giving this, and so the, this is what's going to happen. And so Daniel gets to know this. The thing is, is that when you give the truth, you can always confirm it. God is the truth. He speaks the truth so you can confirm it. Satan never does because he speaks lies. When his mouth opens, lies come out. And there's no confirmation. And if anyone is depending on lies and you're like, well, can I confirm that? Can you verify that? And guess what happens? 
They either have to lie again or twist it and continue to lie. But if you really dig into to confirm it, guess what's going to happen? They're going to, oh, no, you can't do that. No, they're going to start calling you names and labeling you and so forth, and try to cancel you, do all this stuff. Why? Because they know that when you have a lie, you can't confirm it. Satan, that's all he speaks to lies. So that's just an important thing to remember. God can tell the future, and he's doing so to Daniel. Daniel knows and can trust him because God speaks the truth. He can verify it, and it's been verified already. This is confirmation the third time he's given visions regarding the future. And there are some more things coming as well in later chapters. So what can we find here? Just very briefly, what do we do is we really want to focus in on this king that arises out of the Greek Empire. Okay, because you had Alexander the Great, he expanded, got it, died young, 32 years old, and then what happened is, is that his sons were then murdered, and then you had the four generals bro broke off the, 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 the kingdom into four pieces. Two of them became very powerful. That's the Seleucid kings, Syria, kind of Asia, and then you had one more, which is what? Which is the Ptolemies of Egypt. Those two fought quite a bit. The big one he's talking about here, it became the most powerful, and it was very evil, was Antiochus IV Epiphanes, meaning God manifest. That's what he declared himself to be. He thought pretty highly of himself. But he also, we learn in verse 24, that he begins to slowly rise, and he grew slowly rise. You saw that in the vision. He just slowly came out. But his power is not from himself, and that's what um, Gabriel says in 20, verse 24. So his power comes from where? Well, since he sets himself up against God, I don't think God's empowering him to set himself up against himself. Now, I think, he's, I think this is Satan that is empowering him to pit himself up against God. Because that's what Satan does. He's the enemy of our souls. He's God's mortal enemy, you know, eternal enemy, and so he is ours as well. And what it does is this guy, he overruns the promised land. He heavily persecutes God's people for seven years. Thus, the 2,300 days, these are not 2,300 sacrifices. Because if you look at the pattern, 2300, you know, for 2300, there are evenings and mornings, right? That pattern of evenings and mornings goes back to Genesis 1, referring to a day. Evenings and it was morning, day one, day two, day three, day four, right? Evenings and mornings. It's the same pattern, okay? That's consistent with what he does. He is. So this guy, during this seven-year period, the first thing he does is he has the high priest murdered in 170 B.C. Seven years later, in December of 163 B.C., the Maccabean family led a revolt, and guess what happened was they freed, they purified the temple, and they restarted the sacrificial system. They reconsecrated the temple, the sanctuary, just as the prophecy here says what happened. It's 2,300 days, seven years. It's amazing how it works out. We can fit history in, and it's a perfect fit. Now, during that time period, he stops the daily sacrifices. He erects a statue and altar to Zeus in the temple. Uh, he makes it illegal for them to worship Yahweh, to be able to possess, even read a, a scroll of God that's considered illegal. He burned many of them. Um, if they must worship the fake Greek gods, he made that so that it was illegal for them to worship, the, worship Yahweh, worship Adonai, the one true God. Yes. Uh, he killed tens of thousands of the Jewish people, men, women, and children, after an embarrassing military defeat at the hands of the Ptolemies in Egypt. He went down there to invade, and he lost. And he came back, and he just got angry, so he took it out on the, on the Jewish people. He also, because they were kind of rebelling against him a little bit, um, he also then desecrates the altar by slaughtering a pig on it. And he, I mean, basically, if you look at all the actions of this man, he's, his desire seemed to be to eliminate the worship of God. You must get rid of Yahweh. You must get rid of Adonai. You must instead embrace what? Zeus and all these other Greek gods because they're superior. This is a repeated theme throughout history. How many times have nations tried to eliminate the Jewish people, God's people, the worship of the one true God, and to also to eliminate the church? I mean, it has happened over and over and over, and it's failed every single time. Although there's great suffering, I agree, but it has failed. It has failed. And the temple in 163 BC was then, by the Maccabean family, was purified, and they restarted the sacrificial system, and they relit the lampstand. They didn't have enough oil, because if the light's supposed to be lit and stay lit, it's not supposed to be extinguished, and they didn't have enough oil to keep it going, but it kept burning. It was a miracle, um, showing God's favor, God's blessing that they had done this, and it's what Hanukkah celebrates in December. Festival of Lights, the miracle of the, of the oil, of the lampstand. 
But it's just got to raise some questions. Though. Why would the temple be desecrated again? Why would thousands of God's people have to die again? I mean, after all, they were just exiled. Remember, they, remember in Daniel's day, they're exiled because of the rebellion against God, because of their idolatry, because of disobeying God and disobeying and, listening, and ignoring His ways. Even though they, He sent prophets to remind them constantly, they ignored them and killed some of them. Because of their uncontrolled and corrupted sexuality, because of their gluttony, their greed, you name it, the whole host of tremendous, just, just evil that they had committed. And they would not repent of it. And because of that, God said, you will be exiled. They're exiled for 70 years, which He said He would do. For 70 years, Jeremiah is the one who specifically stated that. And then through that, they knew that under Darius, there would be a king who was also specifically mentioned in prophecy. I believe it's Isaiah who mentions him. He would be the one who would return. The Jewish people would begin to return back to the promised land. And they were commanded by God through King Darius of the Persians, the Medo-Persians, to return and rebuild the temple under the leadership of Zerubbabel. 70 years later, they were done this. I mean, it's just... This is what's happening. So you would think that, wow, you're right. We should never turn away from God again. Not so fast. It didn't even take long. Look, as Prophet Haggai said in chapter 1, verse 2, said, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. They're in the promised land. They laid the foundation for the temple, but they stopped. And they're now saying that the time is not yet right for them to build the Lord's house. But we've got to take care of our own. And he says this, and Haggai asked them, Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses? they got some nice houses that they're building. While this house remains a ruin, well, God's house is nothing. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. In other words, think about your life. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. In other words, this. They harvest, but it's weak. They're struggling because the harvest is weak, the food is not plentiful, clothing isn't warm enough, and guess what? The wages are constantly drained. They are struggling as a people. They want to be happy and accepted and fulfilled, but they're struggling right now. And, but so what are they saying? <clears throat> God, I know your command. But you know what? It's not time yet to build your house. You know why? Because we're struggling right now. we got to get a little bit more food, we'll just improve upon the food, we food upon our clothing, so we this and that, and also we got to get a little more income. When we're in a better position, then I will be building your house. Ecclesiastes reminds us that there is really nothing new under the sun. We do the same thing today, don't we? We can fall so easily into the devil's trap of thinking that I need just a little bit more. Then I'll be able to serve you yet. I'll be in a better position to serve you, a better position to follow and obey your command. You see, you see I want to have a happy, accepted, and fulfilled life. So when I get that, I'm there, God. I'm your man. I'm your woman. You name it, whatever I am. I'm your person. <laughs> I'm there for you. I just need a little bit more time. I got a lot of things going on right now. Maybe I need just a little bit more training and education. Once I get that, <clears throat> then I'm there, but I'm just I'm not quite there yet. Got to get my degree. I got four more courses to go, right? Maybe I just need a little more money. Oh God, you know, if I just have a little more income, I'm working several jobs and I just really can't do it. I don't have time. I got to work these jobs right now because I'm trying to get these extra. Of course, you know, I'm going on these trips. I got all kinds of extra stuff I probably don't really need. But hey, you know what? I got to pay for these. I got these big bills. Yeah, because I've made very bad purchases probably. Or God, if you just gave me confidence, I got to practice a little bit more and I can be a witness. But I can't do that yet. I'm just not quite ready. Oh God, you know, I got a lot of I got a lot of projects going on. When I get this, when I get these projects done, then I'm good. I got, I got another six months. Then, then I'm gonna be good. You know what's gonna happen in the six months? You build another, you get into another project. It's like, oh God, it's another six months. But it's gonna happen soon. Soon I will be there when I'm in a better position, and that's gonna happen soon, God. According to if I get that promotion, if I get this, I get that, whatever that plan is, if I get that position, then better, I will be better equipped and I will be able to serve you and do it. And that's when we can build your house. But it's all backwards. 
It's all backwards. We get the created order backwards. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus explicitly teaches us that to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. And then what? Our needs like food, clothing, <laughs> shelter, all that stuff. Guess what? All those things that were not plentiful in Jerusalem and Haggai's day will be met. You will have what you need. But you've got to seek God and his righteousness, his way. Follow him and obey him first. Well, it didn't do the Jews any good to hear that from Jesus because in Haggai's day, Jesus hadn't been around. So I guess they didn't understand it, right? No, I'm sure they understood it. Deuteronomy chapter 28 teaches the exact same thing. You'll be blessed if you, if you follow and obey the commands and follow God. Guess what? You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country, it says. It says that your, the fruit of your womb is going to be blessed. The fruit of your field, your flocks and your harvest and stuff are going to be, are going to be blessed as well. In other words, you are going to have abundance. You are going to have more than everything you need. In other words, you obey me, God says. You will find a blessing. We got it backwards. We want to find the blessing, and then when we do that, then we're going to do the obedience. Uh uh, that's not the way it works. But that's the way we want it. We want it backwards. We want the blessing first, don't we? And I believe that because there's going to be the suffering that Daniel sees, that he understands. He understands, and what it means is that his people down the road, are going to continue to rebel against God. They're going to seek the blessing first and not obey Him. They're going to pursue the things of this world and not obey God. And they're going to be seeking the blessing first. And you don't get that unless you obey Him. And because they're going to rebel, they're going to suffer. And I think that's what hurts Daniel, that he realizes, because God's in His law states, if you follow me, you will be blessed. And if you don't, you're going to, this is what's going to happen. The suffering that's going to come, the confusion that's going to come, you will not be happy, you will not be accepted, and you will not be fulfilled. But if you follow me first, and you obey God first, obey Jesus, you know what? We will find we are accepted. We will find incredible happiness, and we will find fulfillment and acceptance in our life. We'll find the blessing. You see, with the Lord, what it is is that you do not find obedience through blessing. We know this as parents. If you spoil your kids and give them absolutely everything in hopes that, okay, now that they've given them everything, now they'll listen to me. Pfft, no, they won't. Because they never have enough. The obedience and the listening does not come because you have been showered with great blessings. God saying that you will find the great blessing when you obey me. You will find the great blessing through obedience. In Acts chapter 6, Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit, when he was given the assignment to help with the distribution of food with the widows, he also preached, and he and the, the synagogue of the freedmen opposed Stephen. And it tells us that they went to argue with him. And they could not argue and stand against the wisdom that he was given as he spoke. Not before he spoke, not after he spoke, but when he spoke. In other words, as he was obeying God, the blessing of wisdom was coming. When we obey the Lord our God, that's when we discover the blessing. And that's exactly what Jesus taught. That's exactly what Deuteronomy 28, and I think that's what Daniel senses. But his people, he knows in the future, they're going to get it backwards again. They're going to flip it, and they're going to seek the blessing first, and they're going to suffer. They're going to struggle because they're going to seek their own path and not follow God's. We need to seek God's path. Because that path leads to the blessing because it's a path of obedience. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would help us to be obedient in seeking your path. 
and obeying you. And when we do, we know from your promise that is when the blessing comes. So, Lord, we want to be blessed. We want to that. We, yes, we do desire it. But, Lord, we know that it comes because of our obedience to you. It's exactly the way you created us. You created and designed us. You created order. It's for us to obey you. That's what a blessing is. So help us, Lord, to not fall prey to the devil's schemes, but to stand strong wearing your armor so we can stand against it as we obey you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless.